بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته ي إن الله وملائكته الذي يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن أله ولي الله أشهد أن علي حجة الله هيا للصلاة هيا للصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح هيا على خير الأهمال حي على خير الأمم الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله صل على محمد وعلى محمد أحسنت أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فوض أمري لله إن الله بسير بالعباد ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ونعم المولى ونعم النصير والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد الذي سمي في الصماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد اللهم سلام وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم سلام 
وقل بشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله استفاك وتحرك واستفاك على نساء العالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم زينوا مجالسكم بالصلوات على محمد وال محمد ام سلام My respected elders, brothers and sisters in Iman here in Florida, across the globe, wherever you're hearing my voice, a very Jum'ah Mubarak to you and Salaamu Alaikum Jameean wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. <coughs> Question, who is Jesus, son of Mary? We've been discussing the various prophets within Islam as well as Christianity and the different faiths of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the Abrahamic faiths. And we've been discussing, for example, over the past several weeks, the likes of Prophet Dawood and Prophet Sulaiman and all the other prophets. And we're leading to a culmination with today's conversation, which we will continue, inshallah, in the future, life permitting, about Jesus. Being that we are now at the 24th of December, which is known as Christmas Eve in the part of the world in which we live, what significance does this have to you and I? What relationship does this have to you and I? What connection does this have to you and I as citizens of the United States who are living here or in the West at large? What connection does this have with Islam, if any? And what are those questions that surround our life and our relations with others? For example, when we live in this society, when we live in this world, do we live in a vacuum? Do we live that is in a bubble, for example? Do we live where, for example, there are no people of other faiths around us? Indeed, we will find that there are Christians around us, there are Jews around us, there are people of the Hindu faith and various other faiths of God that are here. For example, the Abrahamic faiths, at least the faith of God that we believe. And then you may find people who don't adhere to any religion. What is our responsibility in this framework? I want to discuss a few things with you today, very briefly. And that is, what is the Abrahamic tradition? And then what is the tradition within Christianity of the view of Jesus, peace be upon him, and his mother, and his family, and his line? And what is the view within Islam? Does Islam have any reverence for Isa alayhi salam or Jesus? And what's the view and what's the narrative within Islam? And at the next level, we'll look at a few things in terms of where did this event come from which we are commemorating or our society is commemorating tomorrow? What are the basis of it historically? And what have experts on this actually said with respect to how this emerged? This is our agenda for the brief few moments that we will be together. Wherever you are here in Florida, across the globe, wherever you're hearing my voice, send a salawat on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. From the perspective of the Bible, it's very clear that the very famous narration that has become very known is that Maryam or Mary was with Joseph or Joseph the carpenter or Yusuf al-Najjar, who we call in the Arabic language Yusuf al-Najjar, who according to the biblical narrative, of course we don't accept, but some Christians do accept, that Mary had a husband who helped raise Jesus, who was not the father of Jesus, but helped raise. His name was Yusuf al-Najjar or Joseph the carpenter and they're going in the middle of the night and it's dark and they need a place to lodge a, a place to stay and there's one innkeeper you know how we have motels today hotels and the likes that inns at the time which you will still find around that you can spend the night if you're traveling and this innkeeper does not give them a place to stay and so eventually what ends up happening is they have to find somewhere and Mary is in a state where she's expecting and so they find a barn and they set up house in this barn and then at that point in time Jesus is born. This is the narrative that has become popular and has become known from the Christian perspective, number one. When we come to Islam, what is Islam's view on this? It's quite clear with respect to the view of Islam, in particular the view of the Ahlul Bayt, that there were these lines of prophets, that is Dawood and Sulaiman and continuing in that line, there came by the name of a man named Imran. Imran was from the line of Dawood, he was from the line of Sulaiman or Solomon. And from the view of the Ahlul Bayt, although the general Muslim populace may not accept this, but from the view of the Ahlul Bayt, Imran himself was a prophet of God. Imran has a wife. Imran's wife's name is Hannah. Hannah sees a vision. Hannah is looking out of her window, so to speak, and she then sees a bird that is feeding its children, its baby birds. Now, Hannah and Imran have not had a child at this point in time. Now, parallel to this in the Islamic narrative, Hannah then sees this vision. At the same time, Imran gets revelation that he will have a child. He will have a child and through this child, mercy will come to mankind. 
At that point in time, as time progresses, Hannah then informs Imran that I am expecting. When she informs Imran that I'm expecting, then Imran then says to his wife Hannah that I have gotten revelation and the revelation told to me was that I will have, we will have a child who will be a mercy on mankind. Now, the Quran enshrines this. They are expecting this child to be born. Imran dies during the expectancy, before the child is born. Now they're expecting that this is going to be that child who manifests the prophecy and makes the prophecy come to light. And when the child is born, Hannah had made an oath to God, another to God, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was that? That if you give me a child, because they had not had a child for so many years, if you give me a child, I will give this child in the service to God. That is in service to the house of worship of God. And the child will dedicate their life to worshiping and serving. Very well. At that point in time, when the child was born, they're expecting it to be a boy. It ends up being a girl. Hannah names this child Maryam, who would call Mary in our modern world. And she holds true on her oath and she submits and gives this child to the temple or the house of worship. In under the custody of Prophet Zachariah. Prophet Zachariah, he builds now the first evidence of the chasteness and the purity and the honor of Bibi Maryam, who's one of the four exalted women of Islam, according to the traditions. Asiya, Maryam, Khadija, and Fatima, the highest women of society. He builds a house, a room, in fact, for her in the temple. This was unheard of. At that time, in the house of worship, it was not possible for a woman to stay there, based on their customs. So Zakaria builds for her a place for her to stay, and she stays in the vicinity of the house of worship, and she serves throughout her life. And as time progresses, over time, according to the narrations within the Islamic tradition, an angel descends to her, Jibrail descends to her, in the form of a human being. At first she is startled, at first she is afraid, at first she says, hold on a second, stay away, keep your distance. And according to historians, she is very young, she's a, a teenager at this time, she's not very old. And the angel Jibrail says, Don't, you have nothing to worry about. I've been sent by God. I've been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inform you, to give you the glad tidings that you will be bestowed with a child. And she becomes startled. She says, how? It's not possible. No man has come near me. No man has touched me. What are you talking about? He says, no, this is the will of God Almighty. And at that point in time, there are two narrations. One narration says, Jibrail brought with him heavenly dates or dates from heaven. Or the other one that is told and also Quranic verses reference it is that he blew into her sleeve. There was, he blew into the sleeve of Maryam and then she conceived thereafter. Now one should make this clear that Ruh Allah, which we call Nabi Isa, does not literally mean the spirit of God in the sense that is understood as a physical spirit. That's very important because God cannot have a physical spirit. That is what Jibrail blew, if we accept this narration, into Maryam's sleeve was not the literal spirit of God. It was metaphorical because we believe that God does not have a zaman and makan. It's not, God is not bound by time and space. So it's important to recognize this. God is above the realm of time and space. At that point in time, she then begins to feel the pains of labor, expectancy. Now she's expecting. But the signs are not visible as of yet. Time progresses and Zakaria bids his salutations on Maryam. And when he bids his salutations on to Maryam, he notices that she has food, in particular fruits that are in her room. And he says, where did you get these fruits? Where did they come from? Where did you get these? Nobody's come in, nobody's come out. Where did these come from? And she says, this has come from my Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had arranged for these foods to come to Bimi Maryam while she's there. Then a time emerged, then a moment in time emerged where she was starting to show the signs of pregnancy. Now look, it's an environment that's very difficult. It's difficult today, imagine at that time, where there is a young girl who a society cannot imagine how she's expecting. The allegations would come very quickly. And Maryam was aware of this. And she knew that people would say what they would eventually say afterwards, that your father was a good person, your mother was a good person. How did this child come about when you have not been married? So she, anticipating this, got up and she left the temple. She left the house of worship and she went towards the distance, towards the barren desert. When she went towards the barren desert, there was a palm there where she ultimately was holding fast to, which had not been bearing fruit. 
And at that point in time, she begins to speak and converse, had I not been born, had I not existed. And at this point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears her cries. But of course she has trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do when she's expecting this child? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that palm tree bear fruit and provides her with fruit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes water or streams of water run by the feet of Maryam. So she has water to drink. And the child is born. And at that point in time, she takes this child and she takes the child back into the city. When she takes the child back into the city, she takes on a vow, another, a fast, I should say, a fast of silence. This is one of the forms of fasting in Islam. That is the fast of food and drink that we often do in Shah Ramadan, but also the fast of silence. So she builds and she takes on this fast. She doesn't say anything. At that point in time, when she gets to the city, the people, the rabbis, because the predominant religion at the time is Judaism, according to historians, they begin to say, hold on a second. Where did this child come from? Maryam, you had not married anyone. You had no husband. Where did this child come from? She does nothing. She says nothing. She points to the child. The people begin to laugh. They say, are you serious? Maryam, have you lost it? A child? And then the child speaks miraculously and says that I have been appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my mother's on the right path. And the Quranic verses continue at that point in time. And the Quran enshrines Bibi Maryam with an entire chapter dedicated to her name. In fact, she is mentioned in the Quran 34 times. You will find that Jesus is mentioned 25 times. Our own prophet is only mentioned in the Quran by name four times. In fact, Maryam is the only woman who's mentioned by name in the Quran. The others are alluded to. There are many women that are alluded to, are mentioned, but their name is not taken. Maryam is specifically taken by name. The honor and the prestige of this great lady who gives birth to Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And at that point in time, Isa is that individual who we are common in this belief that he will reappear, that he will come back with Imam Sahib al Asiwa Zaman. And he will establish justice on earth. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And it's vital for us to consider this particularly in this time and era because it's vital for us to build bridges with our Christian brethren in particular and sisters. That is, we live in a multicultural society and you will find the verses that the Quran alludes to acknowledges this and welcomes us building bridges with others. In fact, you'll find the verse of the Quran where the Quran invites us to build bridges and finds that and tells us that we will find the closest to us are those who are called the Nasara because they have amongst them monks and priests who are soft-hearted, who are humble in nature. Similarly, that invites us to reflect that we should be humble, we should be soft-hearted in our relations with them, or anyone for that matter, any human being. Isa alayhi salam, he comes forward and he begins to preach and he begins to teach uh, the gospel, so to speak. What we call the Injil, which is the original Bible in its original form, it actually comes, many people wonder, how does Injil turn into the Bible? Injil actually goes evangel. If you've heard of the term evangelism, evangelism's root is evangel or evangelism, where Injil comes from. At that point in time, he then has 12 disciples as time progresses. Now, one point that we need to remember about Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam, is he came for the downtrodden of society. This is accepted by all historians. He was not here to help the rich get richer. Jesus, peace be upon him, came to make sure that those who were marginalized in society, those who had no one to speak out for them, had a voice. In fact, you will find this for every prophet of God. They came so that those people who are marginalized have a voice. Those people who are discriminated against, those people who are not taken care of, those individuals are looked after. Therefore, a question that we need to ask ourselves, where do we find ourselves? It's not, there's nothing wrong with having something. There's nothing wrong with being affluent. There's nothing wrong with that. However, the question which we'll come to in the second khutbah is, what am I doing with it? How am I making the world a better place for others? Otherwise, what's the point? Those people in history who had wealth are only those are remembered who did good with their wealth. Otherwise, nobody remembers. It's what you do with it. It's what you do with the abilities that God has given you. Similarly, Jesus looked after the downtrodden. Every person who looked after the downtrodden over history was remembered. Because the people's heart in, hearts inclined in that mannerism, in that way, in that direction. Jesus has 12 disciples. His 12 disciples are the one who spread the message throughout the world and throughout the history. But that leaves us with a big question. And that question is, where did Christmas come from? 
where did this historical basis come from? Where did the birth and the celebration of the birth of Jesus on the 25th of December come from? Is that based on the Bible? Is that based on those references? Is that based on what's the basis of that? That's something that inshallah we will look at in the second part of our khutbah inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين فاطر السماوات والأرضين والصلاة والسلام وتحية والإكرام على الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى علي نمير المؤمنين وعلى فاطمة الزحراء سيدة النساء العالمين وعلى حسن المجتبى والحسين الشهيد بكربلاء وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجافر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي وججك على إبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائمة صل على محمد وآل محمد ومسلم Assalamu alaikum, jameeun wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very Jum'ah Mubarak to all of you insha'Allah on this Christmas Eve as well. In the second khutbah of Jum'ah, we wanted to discuss what is going on in our society and our world at large. And what we'll be discussing is the history of Christmas as well as the economic impact of it. Because remember, in the second khutbah, we're talking about our world as it stands today, what's going on in our world. And you'll find that Christmas not only has a historical element, it also has a political element and also has an economic element that we need to be mindful of in order to understand our world. In a few minutes, I just want to give you a quick history and synopsis of where do we get here. Because many of these questions will be alleviated, hopefully, with this conversation. That is, these questions around, can I celebrate Christmas or not, for example? For example, can I have a tree or not? Where does this concept come from? All these things that exist in our society, all of these questions, if we understood the historical basis and we understood what has happened, it would perhaps become clearer for us. Number one, can we celebrate, for example, Christmas? Or can we congratulate others who are, for example, commemorating and celebrating? I would invite you to reflect on something that's well documented, not in ancient history, recent history. Ayatollah Khomeini. You will know there was a time where Ayatollah Khomeini was in exile. And in exile, he went from different places. When he was vanquished from uh, Iran, he had to go to, for example, first to Turkey. And then he went on to, for example, Kuwait and Iraq. And eventually, he ended up in a place called Paris. And when he ended up in Paris, we're told that it was the 25th of December. And he was told that it is Christmas and the people, our neighbors, are celebrating. And he calls on to his son. He tells him to go get some flowers. He goes get some flowers. He says, distribute it amongst our neighbors. It gives us an indict. This is very indicative because this is a marja who's doing this. It's not just your run-of-the-mill individual who's doing this. So it gives us an indication that for people who are celebrating something, for us to help and encourage them and actually show that we're good neighbors, there's nothing wrong with that. So we should be mindful. So for example, if you want to take in donuts on Monday or wherever, for example, or something else on, or if you have already this past week, I don't know if donuts are the best for your health, but whatever you choose to do to indicate happiness and celebration for others, that's something that you should do. But hold on a second. The questions that we have to ask is, for example, where did Christmas come from? Where did this history come from? Where did the tree come from? Where did a lot of these things come from? You have to go back in history. We have to go back to history in the era before Christianity. We have to go to the era of the pagans. We have to go to Europe. We have to go to the Nordic region. We have to go to Scandinavia. We have to go to Norway. We have to go to Germany to understand what happened. There were two celebrations that used to happen in every pagan society in history. And those were what? Those were the winter and the summer solstice. Solstice were those moments where the sun is at its peak or its minimum. It's, it's maximum or their minimum. They also represent the longest day of the year and the shortest day of the year. In Europe, around that time, the winter solstice was around December 21st. In Rome, the winter solstice was around December 25th. So it depends, as you can imagine, where you are in the world at that point in time. 
So what happened? In the Nordic regions, we're talking about modern day Norway and the likes, what would happen was when the winter came to celebrate the winter solstice, father and son would go into the forest. They would go into the forest and they would get the largest lumber that they could find, the largest tree that they could find. When they would get this, they would bring this back and they would light it on fire because it was blisteringly cold outside. And this log would burn for roughly 12 days. When this log would burn for 12 days, they would have a feast of a huge magnitude for those 12 days. And people would celebrate. Look, there's no Christianity on the map right now. It's purely pagan rituals that are happening in the Nordic region. This is how they celebrate it. Similarly, in Germany, they would also celebrate their winter solstice. Now, one thing that you'll remember, the tree that is typically held for Christmas is an evergreen tree. That evergreen tree was a symbol from Europe, from Germany and the Nordic regions in particular. Why? Because the winter solstice and the evergreen tree represented an environment that right now things are dying, right now things are cold, but there will be life because the evergreen tree was the only one that was able to sustain the cold, brutal winters. And well before Christianity, they used to decorate their trees. And that's where that came from. Now, come forward. Eventually, it became a holiday, the 25th of December. Where did this number come from? The ancient Romans, I told you, the ancient Romans had a god by the name of Mithra. Mithra was their god of the sun, sun god. Mithra, remember, the Roman Empire goes from pagan to Christian under Constantine. And after that, predominantly becomes Christian over that time. But there were still many pagan practices that the church could not overturn. The people said, look, we're going to practice this whether you like it or not. So they had the 25th of December was the birth of the church of the God of Mithra in the Roman calendar, the pagan calendar. And they believed that he was born from a rock. He had no father, no mother. He was born from a rock. And the shepherds came and prostrated towards him. This is what historians at Princeton and Oxford have said. This is not my own research, by the way. Anyways, so when they come forward, they say this is what happened. When this happened, at that point in time, the church in the 4th century was faced with, faced with a dilemma. The dilemma they were faced with, they said, look, people are going to practice this anyways. What do we do? Do we ban it outright? If we ban it, we can't stop it. They're going to do it anyways. So what they did was, there was a feast of the god of Mithra that used to happen on December 25th. They adopted it and they said, we will call this the feast of the nativity scene. You know the nativity scene that you see in different churches of where Jesus was born that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture? They said, we will adopt this as the feast of the nativity. And so people began to do this. What's very interesting about this historically, as time progressed and the church began to expand over Europe, in France and in other places, what eventually happened was people would used to go on December 25th. The change which historians said was a very easy change. It was a very small step. Why? Because the Romans believed in the God of the sun and they just had to change one letter from S-U-N to S-O-N. God's son. And they started celebrating in that manner. This is what historians have said. And when that happened, eventually, churches, people used to go to the church. They forgot why, and they forgot. Because all historians say that it's most likely that Jesus was not born in December, in the cold weather. Why? Biblical historians themselves say, because we have narrations in the Bible that says the shepherds were out in the nights. You, the shepherds cannot be out in the nights in December in the cold weather. They would say it's most likely spring. Nonetheless, leaving all of this aside, eventually Christians began to go to church on the 25th in France and in other places. When they used to go, they used to call this the Mass of Christ. In fact, they would call it Christ's Mass. That's where Christmas comes from, Christ's Mass. But what's interesting, if you know the history of Christianity, is for centuries, Christmas celebration was banned by the church. In England, in the 1600s, you were not allowed to. Forget that. In America, 1659, in Boston, you could not commemorate and celebrate Christmas. You had to pay a five shilling fine. Why? Because it was understood by the church that this has nothing to do with Christianity. It was a pagan celebration that people used to rile. 1820, New York City. New York City is flourishing in 1820, economically. The first riot that happens, according to historians in New York City, happened in 1820 on Christmas Day. Because if you went back 200 years, according to historians, Christmas celebration, according to Western historians from Oxford and Princeton and other institutions, they said Christmas 200 years ago in England and America was not like Christmas today. Christmas was more like New Year's. It was more like Halloween. It was more like Mardi Gras. Their words, not mine. 
So what I'm saying is, my dear brothers and sisters, when you are looking to commemorate Christmas, fine, no problem. Especially be happy in other people's happiness. But realize what are the historical backgrounds as to what happened. Where did St. Nicholas come from? You know, where did Santa Claus come from? There's a Christian saint by the name of St. Nicholas. He was born in December 6th is when they would commemorate him. They said December 6th is close enough. Why don't we tie it in with Christmas? Eventually what happened for 70 years when America was founded, 80 years, the first 70 to 80 years, Christmas was not a holiday in America, by the way. Congress used to meet on that day. But eventually what happened was people realized that we're working all day. We need holidays. We need some days off. So they said, let's do this. But there was no secularization of Christmas until novelists came about. Novelists in the United Kingdom and the United States, such as Washington Irving, and the most classical of them, Charles Dickens. When Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol, he, bre he breathed into Christmas a spirit in a secular holiday. How did he do that? He gave the example of a man by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. And I have to conclude because of the shortness of time. Please bear with me in the next few minutes. He said, look, there's this wealthy guy who's a wealthy businessman. I'm sure you've all read or heard or seen the Christmas Carol by now. And he's this wealthy guy who owns this huge business and he's considered a, a miser, to say it softly. And his employees want a day off on the 25th and he says, look, 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 why are you going to steal from your employer one, one time a year? And so he goes, and then he dies, or he has a vision with the ghost of Christmas past, so to speak. And eventually he says that, look, you're dead now. And people are going to remember you in the worst of ways. And then after seeing that realization, he comes forward and says, hold on. I'm going to, he goes to his employees, he gives people gifts. He begins to say, look, I'm going to raise your salary. I'm going to give, make, you, make things better for you. And he has a change of heart, which gives people the spirit of Christmas that says, look, Christmas is about doing better for others. And it's not about you, which is a good spirit. And this is the key kicker. What historians say was, in the late part of the 1900s and the earliest 20th century, they realized that the world's greatest salesman, not my words again, the world's greatest salesman is Santa Claus. And they said the reason is because in this process of gift giving, Christmas became commercialized. But it make, became commercialized in such a powerful way that he removed Christmas, Santa Claus removed the commercialization element of gift giving. So people are buying and buying and buying. No one stops to think, maybe a small gift is fine, maybe this is fine. No. So that was used as fire to ignite a revolution in terms of business and commerce. Remember this. There's a book written by uh, Max Weber, who's one of the founders of sociology. It's called The Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism, over 200, uh, 150 years ago. And he said, what gave rise to America to become the economic power that it is, was actually the Protestant view of Christianity. And that's what led America to become very wealthy. But ultimately, the religiosity, the concept was that you do good through your religion to help others, and you don't spend all that money on yourself, you help other people. But he said eventually the spirituality of Christianity went by the wayside and people just tried to accumulate more and more and more. What am I saying? There's a lot to say here. I have to leave everything. I'm condensing everything. Just remember this thing. When you were, where did the first Christmas tree come from? According to historians, the first Christmas tree in the modern world came in 1840 or 1848. Well, there's a different opinion. What happened? Queen Victoria married a German ruler, a German prince by the name of Prince Albert. He said, look, we have, we have trees around this time in our part of the world. So he published in a magazine a picture of him with a tree. After that, people began to put trees in their houses. It didn't exist before 1840 in the Western world, in the United Kingdom or the US. So this has nothing to do with the nativity scene, the tree or, or whatnot. It has to do with that custom that was Germanic in nature. The short end of the story is this. Understand the historical origins of Christianity. Understand the historical origins of Christian Christmas. And build bridges with our Christian neighbors. Build bridges with our Christian friends. Build bridges with others. But at the same time, understand that we cannot warp and change religion as it exists. We need to understand where a lot of these things come from. The apples, do you know where the ornaments came from on trees? The ornaments came from trees because when the church said we cannot stop Christmas, they said let's Christianize it, the tree. How did they do it? They said we'll put apples on the tree. Why? The apples were symbolic of the Garden of Eden and the forbidden fruit. So over time that became ornaments. 
So understanding these things can help you answer to your questions that your children may ask you about mama or baba, can I have a tree? And also help us understand where it is that we are going as a society. Is materialism the basis? Giving gifts is beautiful. It's highly recommended in Islam and other faiths. But for the sake of what? For the sake of just bigger is better necessarily? And commercialism without thinking about it? Or is there a real spirit of giving within Christianity and Islam? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let this be a blessed Jum'ah for all of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a peaceful one and allow everyone to have a peaceful, harmonious time. Our thoughts and prayers go to the family of the 14-year-old girl who was shot and killed uh, by police just today. Very tragic. Uh, we are thinking about our world and hoping and praying that there's peace and serenity, especially on the 25th of December tomorrow and throughout the world, inshallah. And to make this a reality, we hope and pray for the reappearance of Imam Sahib al Asuwa's Zaman and allow us to be amongst his companions when he returns. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr. Inna l-insana lafi khusr illa ladhina aman wa amil salihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sab. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله نعم سلام أشهد أن محمد رسول الله نعم سلام أشهد أن علي ولي الله أشهد أن علي حجة الله حي على الصلاح حي على الصلاح حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير الأمل حي على خير الأمل قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله خاتم جماعة إن الصلاة والنسق ومحيا يا وممات لله رب العالمين وجهت وجه الذي فطر السماوات والأرض حنيفا مسلما الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم هو الذي بعث في الأمين رسولا منهم يطلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ظلال مبين وآخرين منهم لما يلحقوا بهم وهو العزيز الحكيم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم مثل الذين هم من التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أصفارا بأس مثل القوم الذين كذبوا بآيات الله والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين قل يا أيها الذين هادوا إن زعمتم أنكم أولياء لله من دون الناس فتمنوا الموت إن كنتم صادقين ولا يتمنونه أبدا بما قدمت أيديهم والله عليم بالظالمين 
قل إن الموت الذي تفرون منه فإنه ملاقيكم ثم تردون إلى عالم الغيب والشهادة فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا نوضي للصلاة من يوم الجمعة فسعوا إلى ذكر الله وذعروا البيع ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون فإذا قضيت الصلاة فانتشروا في الأرض وابتغوا من فضل الله واذكروا الله كثيرا لعلكم تفلحون وإذا رأوا تجارة أو لحوا فضل إليها وتركوك قائمة قل ما عند الله خير من اللحو ومن التجارة والله خير الرازقين الله أكبر اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكن عذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمد ربي صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمد ربي صل على محمد وآل محمد يا لطيف ارحم أبدك الضعيف الله أكبر الحمد لله وخير الأسماء لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك أيها النبي ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم عرفني نفسك فإنك إن لم تعرفني نفسك لم أعرف نبيك 
اللهم عرفني رسولك فإنك إن لم تعرفني رسولك لم أعرف حجتك اللهم عرفني حجتك فإنك إن لم تعرفني حجتك ضللت عن ديني أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن علي ولي الله أشهد أن علي حجة الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير الأمل حي على خير الأمل قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الصلاة ونسوق المحيا إني وجهت وجه الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كذلك الله ربي اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي الأعلى وبحمده الله أكبر الحمد لله وخير الأسماء لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمده سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمده الله أكبر استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمده الله أكبر بحول الله وقوته أقوم وأقعد وأرقى وأسجد الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العظيم وبحمد ربي صلي على محمد وآل محمد سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحان ربي العلا وبحمد ربي صلي على محمد وآل محمد 
Allahu Akbar astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu ilaih Allahu Akbar Subhanallah 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 rabbi ala ala wa bihamd rabbi salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad ya latif irhamad dika dhaif Allahu Akbar alhamdulillah wa khairul asma'i lillah ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabiy wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi as-salihin Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allahu akbar Allahu akbar Allahu akbar الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا إله إلا الله إلها واحدا ونحن له مسلمون لا إله إلا الله ولا نعبد إلا إياه مخلصين له الدين ولو كره المشركون لا إله إلا الله ربنا ورب آبائنا الأولين لا إله إلا الله وحده 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 أنجزا وعدا ونصر عبدا وعزا جندا وحزم الأحزاب وحدا فله الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت ويميت ويحيي وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير طرب إذا دعاه ويخشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء عدم البلاء فرح الخفاء وانكشف القطاع القطاع الرجاء الأرض ومنعت السماء مستعان وإليك المشتكى السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين السلام عليك يا فاطمة زهراء سيدتي نساء العالمين 
السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله الحسين السلام عليك يا علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي السلام عليك يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب العصر والزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمن السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا إمامنا وإمام الإنس والجان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله تعالى مخرجك وظهورك ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقاعدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين